I am genetically predisposed to be a domestic, like my grandmother and her mother. I am not a domestic. I'm not even a tidy woman. In my own home, I only clean when absolutely necessary. Yet I walk into public bathrooms and begin to clean the toilets. After I wash my hands, I wipe the sink dry and keep drying until a whole row of sinks gleam. I can't help myself. In restaurants, I clear crumbs from the table of people sitting next to me before the waiters have a chance. I do not accept tips. In bathrooms, I sing a happy song while I work. I do this when no one is looking. I do this for the sheer joy of cleaning that which does not belong to me. I do not know why I still do this. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, and welcome to the March on Washington Film Festival. It's a real honor and pleasure to be back here again. My name is Holly Bass. I am a performance artist and poet, and I'm accompanied here by Lionel Frazier White on the drums. <laughs> we have a really fantastic evening. I'm going to do a couple more pieces before we see the film on Fannie Lou Hamer, and then um, it will be followed by the panel discussion. Part of why um, uh, Isis Sarabe, the executive uh, director, invited me to perform, we were talking, and I was sharing some of my own family history and that, like Fannie Lou Hamer, my grandmother was a sharecropper. And then she later sort of moved on up to being a domestic, uh, cleaning white people's homes in a small town in southern Georgia. And my father also worked in the fields. And actually, I don't know if any of you noticed, there are several videos playing outside. That's an exhibition. And the first um, television monitor actually has videos of my work, which I encourage you to take a look at on your way out. And I did a series with my father, um, some experimental and uh, one sort of short documentary. And it, it wasn't until I did this project that I learned he started picking cotton when he was five. And he continued doing that until he was 15. And so this next piece, it's called Better Roses. And it's when I first learned about uh, my father's uh, growing up and working in the fields. Better Roses, Georgia, August 1999. Driving back from Albany, I tell my father that I'd like a piece of cotton to take back with me. We stop along the road. My father has told me how he used to pick cotton every day after school during harvest. Three and a half cents per pound. The most he ever picked in one day was 214 pounds. 40 years later, he still remembers this number, still remembers the excitement of seven hard-earned dollars in his hand. I open my car door. I'll get it, Daddy says. What you want, just a cotton bowl? He looks across the field for signs of a shotgun-toting, overzealous farmer guarding his crop. No one in sight. He wades through high grass and dress slacks and good shoes. I pray the ground is dry. He pulls off three nice bowls. From where I am, it looks like he is picking small white roses for me. He returns to the car and places them in my hand. I examine these strange flowers, turning them by the stem. The papery leaves crumble as I touch them. The hard hull, pointed enough to draw blood, dark as my own skin. Thank you so much. So this last piece requires a little bit of audience participation. And I promise you, it's quite painless. 
and it's optional, but it's a bit of an incantation, so I highly recommend that you do participate, because I'm not responsible for what happens if you don't. It's very simple. When I, at several points in the poem, I'm gonna say the word underground, and your job is to whisper underground, underground, underground. So three times. So uh, let's just practice before we begin. So when I say underground, Yes, that's right. So you just whisper three times in a row very quickly. All right, so let's begin. And um, I decided to um, perform this poem because I think of it as a kind of, um, uh, almost like a spiritual anthem to artists and activists. And so I dedicate it to the memory of Fannie Lou Hamer tonight. Record scratches reach deep. My bone marrow leaks through seep holes the size of a millisecond. I'm a militant activist of sound, of dissonance. Viva the Stravinsky seekers, socialist music fiends dubbing fat beats, creating symphonies, cacophonies, beats, rhymes, life. My mental blade displayed zigzag cuts new lines and black wax more jagged than Billie Holiday's tracks. Intertwined with an Ellington line, melancholy so indigo blue, true that you knew, but tried to deny. Underneath the black bleeding a million microscopic pricks of black kneading. Too many for us to count now. So just return underground. Inside a coal mine, elements of my core reside. I flip the script like a diamond dies and returns to coal. Its soul still remembers crystal slivers of what it used to be. Light hardening. Yellow canary still rescues me. I hear its melody. I escape devastation. See me rise above the crumbling of tunnel walls. But now above ground, my voice grows small. But when the earth shakes, I dance with her. Fine rhythm in the shifting of tectonic plates, nuclear waste, meltdown, atavistic organism. I be, my links are earthly, deep inside the center, below the touch of winter. So again, I return underground. Third round begins with divination. Questioning by analysts and doctors who cannot dream. What is this thing called dreaming, they ask. Who are you to make gods of your imaginings? Imagination is everything. I imagine the future I want to see. Underneath harsh lights of hospitals and stages, I begin to retrograde, uh, forgetting who I am, my mission to replenish the Earth's reserves of understanding. Yes. My black body, broken, and bleeding, my black blood curving and seething. I am my own communion. Eat and drink of me. Be blessed by my suffering and this music I make. It's the most beautiful thing. And this music I make 
is all underground. And this music, sweet music, this music I make. Tell me, what do you make of these small black sounds? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, one of our principal supporters, uh, I'm not going to say her name unless she winks and nods, um, <laughs> the head of the DC uh, Cable Television Arts, I got that title wrong, commission, <laughs> our arts director for the District of Columbia, Director Gates, is here. And I'm going to call her out a little bit because her, her presence at a past festival really exemplifies why we do this. She came to a similar documentary film about, about an event that occurred in Mississippi, Booker's Place, and came up to us after the program and said what hundreds of you say to us and which gives us the impetus to keep doing this program. Why didn't I know this? Why didn't I know this? And this film is an extremely important addition to that canon. Robin Hamilton has done, it's a short film and it packs a wallop. And we're incredibly grateful, not only has she done this film, but she's got another one in the works, and unless she tells me not to, I'm gonna tell you what it is. <laughs> it's about Mary Church Terrell, yeah. an extremely important figure in American history, and I think you'll see a theme here, and part of our festival really focuses on the lack of education about women and the women who are the backbone, and in many cases, the front bone, I know that's not a bone, but, <laughs> of the movement. We recently uh, were reminded that during the infamous speech, uh, the March on Washington, for which this festival is named, it's actually Mahalia Jackson on the podium who says to Dr. King, three quarters into his speech, tell him about the dream, Martin. Tell him about the dream, a small thing, but given the importance of that speech, not so small. I am extremely, extremely honored and excited for you to see this film about Fannie Lou Hamer. In addition to being great, the thing that strikes me, and I lived in Mississippi as a younger person, um, and, and it really hit home there. Miss Hamer doesn't make it through the sixth grade she cannot functionally read or write. She works, as did most people in her situation, under extraordinary conditions with no legal or economic recourse. She finds a way to push back, like Recy Taylor did in Alabama, like Septima Clark, like Ella Baker. She found a way and worked with other people to see something that others couldn't see, the creation of an entirely separate party, the ability to get to Atlantic City and to make the famous speech that set certainly the Democratic Party off in a different direction and arguably this nation. And the thing that strikes me about her, and it's really a statement about us, not her, there is no county named Hamer County. There is no bridge. There is no tunnel. There is no major intersection. There is no series of high schools. This woman is an American revolutionary hero. She pushed the nation in a singular fashion to get closer to its alleged ideals and expressions of liberty. But we don't honor her in that way, we don't teach her in that way. So this festival is dedicated to doing its part to change that. Thank you so much for the work that you've done in putting this together. We're gonna to see the film and then you're gonna be treated to uh, a tremendous conversation among, and, and I should have mentioned with the Septima Clark and Ella Baker, Dory and Joyce Ladner, uh, who made phenomenal and continue to make phenomenal contributions to this nation. Thank you all very much for coming. We appreciate you. Enjoy the film.
You all look good. You sound good. <laughs> so now we're going to enter into our uh, panel discussion, and afterwards we'll have a bit of Q and A. And to moderate our beautiful panel is my good friend, uh, Dr. Kimberly Jeffries Leonard. Kim, over to you. Thank you, Sam. Um, I am so very pleased to be here tonight. Um, first of all, being able to view this powerful film. Secondly, being at NYU's DC campus, my oldest son is a senior, so I told him and he asked me to represent well. <laughs> and uh, so I'm representing from NYU New York. I'd like to take a moment to introduce our illustrious panel. Um, first, Ms. Dory Ladner, who you saw in the film. She is a civil rights activist, born on June 28th, 1942 in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. When she was an adolescent, she became involved in the NAACP youth chapter, where Clyde Kennard served as an advisor. She got involved in the civil rights movement and wanted to be an activist after hearing about the murder of Emmett Till. After graduating from Earl Trevelyan High School as a salutatorian, alongside her sister, Joyce Ladner, she went on to enroll at Jackson State University. Dedicated to the fight for civil rights during their freshman year at Jackson State, she and her sister attended the state NAACP meetings with Medgar Evers and Ellen Beard. That same year, she was expelled from Jackson State for participating in a protest against the jailing of nine students from Tougaloo College. In 1961, Ms. Ladner entered Tougaloo College, where she became engaged with the Freedom Riders. During the early 1960s, racial hostilities in the South caused her to drop out of school three times to join the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. In 1962, she was arrested along with Charles Bracey, a Tougaloo College student, for attempting to integrate the Woolworths lunch counter. She joined with SNCC Project Director Robert Moses and others from SNCC and the Congress of Racial Equ Equality to register disenfranchised black voters and integrate public accommodations. Her civil rights work was exemplified when she became one of the founding members of the Council of Federated Organizations in Clarksdale, Mississippi, which included the NAACP, CORE, SNCC, and the SCLC. Then, in 1964, Ms. Ladner became a key organizer in the Freedom Summer Project, sponsored by the COFO. Throughout her years of working with SNCC, she served on the front line in the civil rights movement in various capacities. She participated in every civil rights march from 1963 to 1968, including the March on Washington in 1963, the Selma to Montgomery March of 1965, and the Poor People's March in 1968. She was the SNCC project director in Natchez, Mississippi from 1964 to 1966, and lectured at universities, churches, and other institutions to raise money for the organization. In addition, she was a supporter of the anti-Vietnam War movement and worked in the presidential campaigns of Eugene McCarthy and George McGovern. She went on to serve as a community organizer for the anti-poverty program in St. Louis, Missouri, and was an advocate for civil rights in housing and employment. Ms. Ladner has also worked for the Martin Luther King Library Documentation Center to help collect the history of people who were participants in the civil rights movement. In 1973, after her marriage and the birth of her only child, Ms. Ladner earned her, earned her BA degree from Tougaloo College. In 1974, she moved here to Washington, D.C. and enrolled at the Howard University School of Social Work, where she earned her MSW degree in 1975. She's worked as a clinical social worker in both Washington, D.C. General Emergency Room and the Psychiatry Department for 30 years. Since her retirement, she has continued to work as a social activist by participating in genealogical research, public speaking, anti-war activities, and volunteering in the presidential campaign of Barack Obama. Ms. Ladner. It's, it's now my honor to introduce our dynamic director of this film, Robin Hamilton. Robin is an Emmy Award-winning journalist, television host, moderator, and writer. 
She has worked for network affiliates around the country, including Florida, New York, and Massachusetts. Currently, she's based in Washington, D.C., and she's a correspondent for the local Tribune Affiliates news program, news magazine program, News Plus. And she's hosted DC 50 TV's award-winning award Black History Month series for the past four years. Robin has also served as a public media fellow, a program under the National Black Programming Consortium, which helps underserved communities adopt social media tools. She's received two master's degrees, one from New York University, with a concentration in broadcast journalism, and a second in public administration from Harvard University's John F. Kennedy School of Government, with a focus on policy and media. This little light of mine, the legacy of Fannie Lou Hamer, was her directorial debut. Robin. Thank you. My first question is to our extraordinary director, Robin, of this powerful film. What inspired you to direct a film about Fannie Lou Hamer? Uh, when I was in undergrad, I had taken a class about women in the civil rights movement. And what struck me was how little I knew about the women who were literally the foundation of the movement. And not to take away anything from the heroics of the men, but there were women like, of course, Mrs. Hamer and Ella Baker and so many who were on the front lines, who kept things running smoothly, who were passing out the flyers, who were making sandwiches during the marches, who were doing so many things that people didn't see. And I had gotten this book by Kay Mills. It's called This Little Light of Mine, The Life of Fannie Lou Hamer. And I was so moved by her story and who she was and her strength and her resilience and it, you know, not everybody believes in this, but for me, she stayed with me. I, mm -hmm. I met her in this class, and her spirit stayed with me, and I knew I wanted to do something about her. And so years passed, and I um, had a chance when I was in Boston to meet some people who had worked with her when the Democratic National Convention came mm -hmm. there in 2004. They were doing the 40th anniversary of her historic speech at the DNC in um, New Jersey. And I was meeting these people, and they were telling me these amazing stories. And I thought, oh, I got to do something. I got to do something. And one of them was Lawrence Guiot, who was this phenomenal activist who worked with Mrs. Hamer. At any rate, more time passed. I reached out to him, and I found out he had passed away. And I said, I can't waste any more time. And so I, I went back through the book, and I started to find people's names and people who would talk to me. And it was a gold mine that I met Mrs. Ladner. I was so fortunate to be able to reach out to her and have her um, be so welcoming, a, a woman of her stature, to be open to talk to me, someone, no name, no connections, nothing. And um, that's when I, meeting her and several other people, I just knew I, I needed to get this done. Wow. Well, we're, we're so glad you did. You. Well, speaking of, of meeting Ms. Ladner, Dory, you were featured very prominently in the film, and clearly you were there as these events unfolded, young enough to be Mrs. Hamer's daughter. What impact did she have on your life in the area of social justice? Uh, watching that film brought back so many memories to me, and I'm glad uh, Dr. Bernice Johnson Reagan is here uh, from SNCC. <laughs> I don't know who else was here, but that gives me comfort and support because when we started talking about these songs, uh, I thought about Bernice, you know, we vibrate back and forth. But um, what um, drew me to Miss Hamer and um, made me feel so um, inspired was that me being a young black woman, Miss Hamer was old enough to be my mother. And to meet her under the conditions that we met there in the Delta of Mississippi, Sunflower County, where I'd heard about these, uh, had these horrible images of Emmett Till being murdered. And uh, my first time going to the Delta, I'm from the southern part of Mississippi, the Gulf Coast part of Mississippi. And so uh, on that fateful day, and I encountered this lady, uh, I, I was moved. 
I'm rambling, I'm rambling, but I'm just recovering from seeing this film. I have these images. I think I've said something about these mask, the mask covers a lot, but uh, you know, this is like uh, pulling a lot of stuff out of me mm -hmm. that I've kept mm -hmm. buried. Mm -hmm. So you have to bear with me uh, uh, through a lot of this trauma that we've been through. You know, I have PTSD of mm -hmm. a different mm -hmm. type. So um, mm -hmm. I hope you'll understand. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, <clears throat> Ms. Hamer which was such a rock and an inspiration of, if I may digress, going to the courthouse that day on that yellow bus, uh, sharecroppers who had never attempted to register to vote and who uh, were under the most hostile of conditions, most dangerous conditions, white men with guns at the courthouse. That's where you met them. And uh, we are young people from the SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, running around the courthouse, you know, like little mice, uh, trying to see if everything was all right and, and just trying to stay out of sight while they stood there in line to, uh, to attempt to register to vote. And uh, once they all got in and they were all turned away and got on this yellow bus to go back to Ruleville, the bus was stopped. And they were told, this was the same bus that took the sharecroppers to the field, but they were told it was the wrong color bus. So the bus driver was arrested. <clears throat> they had to make, uh, collect money to pay his bond or fine, and the bus proceeded. But uh, under all these conditions, uh, p the people were steadfast. They had had enough. And so I won't go any further, but I was inspired by all the people but Ms. Hamer had a, a different story. The other di stories didn't spill over at that particular time, mm -hmm. if you understand what I mean. Mm -hmm. Hers mm -hmm. spilled over that particular night. Mm -hmm. Wow. We can see the impact mm -hmm. from your resume. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> You, you can continue okay. asking the question. Okay. <laughs> well, let me ask you this one, Ms. Ladner. Mrs. Hamer started as a sharecropper. Yeah. And they, we talked about that in the film. How did, based, because you were there and you saw this uh, in real time, how did she adapt to being a field secretary for SNCC coming from that world? Well, there were a lot of steps in between because um, once, Ms. Hamer was kicked off the plantation, went to live the, with Mr. and Mrs. Sisson there in uh, Ruleville, Mississippi. She, uh, you heard her talking about the house being shot up. Mm -hmm. And uh, Coley Liddell, who was from Jackson, Mississippi, and I were also the two females who were working there in the Delta. And people thought that Coley and I had gotten shot. There were two young women from Cleveland, Mississippi, who were in the uh, Sisson shot house who were shot, who sustained gunshot wounds to the head and were shot. Ms. Hamer happened not to be there. Uh, this was shortly after going to the courthouse. So uh, the uh, adaptation, you know, uh, and Ms. Hamer had to go, went through all these steps. Uh, of, it didn't just go from Ruleville, that was 1962, August of 1962, when we went to the courthouse. We went to Atlanta City in 19, August of 1964. Mm -hmm. So you had a lot of time in between. Mm -hmm. So Ms. Hamer had the opportunity to, to uh, meet with uh, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and other people, uh, Ms. Victoria Jackson Gray Adams, Ms. Anna Devine, Ms. Hazel Palmer, mm -hmm. Ms. Cameron, and many other people uh, from the state of Mississippi and from outside of Mississippi. You saw uh, Heather Booth there, the young white woman, and uh, there were many bridges that were being, uh, alliances that were being, we had, joined with friends of uh, SNCC and uh, all kinds of people who were instrumental in helping us to uh, get our message out. Uh, you know, we were the dark ages back then. We had the stencils and <laughs> one phone and a public phone and so forth. And I remember staying at the Fisher's house in uh, Sylvia, Charlie and Sylvia Fisher's house in Chicago in Hyde Park and where Heather Booth lived. Uh, but, uh, we had to do a lot of work before we got to Atlantic City. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of work in between. Also in the state of Mississippi, we were riding up and down the highways, uh, organizing. We were community organizers. Mm -hmm. 
And so we were organizing people. We had a message. I, I compare Ms. Hamer with Ida B. Wells. Uh, I'm not sure if many of you, uh, a lot of you may know Miss Ida B. Wells' history from Holly Springs, Mississippi, who moved on to Memphis, who was a newspaper woman and uh, who eventually moved north. But Ms. Hamer and Ms. Wells' life compared. Uh, Ms. Hamer was a young a woman, and Ms. Wells was a young woman uh, who had to take care of her family. Ms. Hamer was on, at the end of her family is, in terms of age. But Ms. Wells had to provide for her family and moved to Memphis because uh, she was, started running a newspaper and was chased out of uh, Mississippi and had to go to Memphis. But there's a, there are a lot of similarities between Ms. Wells and Ms. Hamer. And if you study Ms. Wells you, and compare Ms. Hamer, you will uh, get more of an idea of what I'm talking about. There are some historians in here, many of you are historians. But uh, there were a lot of steps in between. Mm -hmm. You just didn't go from being a person who identified yourself as one to work in the movement. There was a lot of work that you had to do. You had to work. You had to earn your keep. Mm -hmm. You had to, uh, there was a lot to learn. Mm -hmm. Even the Mississippi Constitution, we studied that. Mm -hmm. We had workshops. We had to go to Mount Buell outside of Jackson, Mississippi for retreats. Mm -hmm. Went to Highlander uh, Folk Center in Tennessee for training. When Dr. Martin Luther King and Ms. Stephanie McClark and all of them went, we, we had a lot of work. We had a lot of studying to do mm -hmm. before we got to that space. OK? OK, thanks. I'm going to um, ask Robin a quick question now. Sure. You told us that this was a film that you had wanted to do for a long mm -hmm. time, um, starting back with your introduction to Mrs. Hamer in, in your class. So from a filmmaking perspective, you shared a little bit about some of the process, but you, could you go into a little more depth on how you put this together, how you identified the participants and got the archival footage, and finally, what was the family's reaction when they saw it and you pulled it together? Oh, um, thank you, Kim. That's a good question. Um, so um, it was... Uh, it was a lengthy process, but it wasn't. And it was l lengthy in that I had carried this story for over 15 years since I had graduated from, from college. But um, it was quick in that I knew there was a level of urgency in that if I wanted to really capitalize on people who are willing to talk to me, like Ms. Ladner, um, you know, they have a story to tell that is so important. And um, not everybody wanted to talk. And so I would go through. Um, when I was doing reading her um, her biography, I noticed that um, there were the big names that initially I reached out to. You know, Harry Belafonte was wonderful, and Gloria Steinem, but they also, you know, they're just very big names, and it's very hard to reach them. And, and I just, I had a moment, and I thought, well, um, I really want to connect with people who knew her personally. And um, so I reached out to, when I reached out to Ms. Ladner and uh, Mrs. Booth, and Dr. Leslie McLemore, he was wonderful, and Reverend King, and they were really there with her on the front lines. And there were a couple other people I wanted to, from the, my research, who I wanted to reach out to. One was um, Unita, Unita Blackwell, who I'm sure you remember, was one of Mrs. Hamer's best friends. They were thick as thieves, and she has an amazing story in that after all she went through, she actually became mayor of one of the small towns in Mississippi when it was all said and done. This very sad thing is that she, um, unfortunately now has Alzheimer's and just was not available. And I, I, I had found arc, an archival interview with her and it pains me that I couldn't have in, included her because I think she would have been wonderful. Mm -hmm. And then there was also um, Uvester Simpson in, and she was, um, like Ms. Ladner, was a student mm -hmm. and she had actually been jailed um, with Mrs. Hamer the night that she was beaten. And I had called her up and we had a lovely conversation and I asked her, um, would you be willing to do this? And she would only say, she said she had been interviewed once uh, before, and they were very um, cavalier and insensitive about what she had been through. Mm -hmm. And she said that her experience in the jail was so traumatic. And like Ms. Ladner, she says, I still have nightmares mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. that time. You know, I mm -hmm. still remember <laughs> hearing, I, she, I, she says, I just remember it all. And she says, I just can't go back there. Mm -hmm. So that was very, um, it was very hard, mm -hmm. you know, I, 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 felt, I felt for her and um, I think her story would have been very powerful, but I, mm -hmm. I was pained that it, it was still so present mm -hmm. for her too. Mm -hmm. um, so all that being said, um, so, the, so I was very fortunate and blessed to have the people I did who, um, who 
agreed to participate. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of research, I literally just parked myself in the Library of Congress and just started going through papers, newspapers, and archives. And um, and then I went to Tougaloo, who was very kind to me. They had, they hold her um, family papers mm -hmm. and so and her family photos, mm -hmm. and they were very very generous about letting me look through those and use them and help me track things down, mm -hmm. and that was wonderful. Um, so those were the real gems in Pacifica Archives. Mm -hmm. um, I went to the Schomburg Center in New York. I mean, I really just culled through everything I could find. I found the really powerful interview of her in the yellow dress mm -hmm. where she's talking about mm -hmm. what happened to her mm -hmm. in the jail. Um, that was from a show in New York called Like It Is mm -hmm. that went off the air, I think, in the late 80s. And um, someone had to dig through someone's basement, but it now belongs mm -hmm. to ABC News. So it was just a lot of digging and asking and pleading and all of that. Um, so that was it, was, it was great in that you do a lot of this alone when you have no money and you have no staff and you have, and you have nothing, but you feel like you know her intimately. I mean, I would be sitting in a library with just headphones on listening to her, you know, and there was something that was very powerful about mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of her family, it was really tricky because um, her daughter, um, Lenora, uh, did not, did not want to speak to me and she there's an interesting dynamic, and Ms. Ladner, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on it. Um, a lot of people from Mississippi are resentful of people from the outside coming in and mm -hmm. telling their stories. There's a little mm -hmm. bit of an us mm -hmm. versus them, mm -hmm. no matter how good your intentions are. Mm -hmm. And so I tried to be very forthcoming about what I was doing. I would, I would share everything as much as I could. Um, and Virgie was very kind to me in that she was willing and open, and I think she's been very receptive to other people telling or sharing her story, mm -hmm. and I think she wants to be included, too. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there have been, uh, you know, I had a couple people look at the film before, and, you know, some people had said, well, she's a little rough around the edges. Do you need to kind of include her? And I said, you know, I think it is important to mm -hmm. include her. I think mm -hmm. she wants to know that she, her voice matters in mm -hmm. this, too. Mm -hmm. um, so she was very open to it, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, it was it was tough. It mm -hmm. was it was challenging. I think they were happy with it at mm -hmm. the at the end. Mm -hmm. I don't know if her other daughter has seen it, mm -hmm. um, but I know that Virgie was was pleased. Okay. Yeah. We do know that each filmmaker and director, when they birth their work, they have a vision of how it will impact society. So, what is your vision for this little light of mine, and have you realized it through this film? Well, um, I have to say. Um, Selfishly, I, I didn't. My vision was really just to get it done, and because I really wanted this to be my love letter to her. If, I know that may sound strange to some people, but I did. I wanted it to be a thank you. I had no reason to make this film. I had no money. Again, I had no connections, nothing. And uh, I just sometimes you feel, um, you know, when the poet Miss Holly said. Um, you know, your sacrifices are my blessings. Mm -hmm. And that's how I feel mm -hmm. with Mrs. Hamer and with Mrs. Ladner and so mm -hmm. many, um, their sacrifices are my blessings. Mm -hmm. And so you don't feel like a thank you is enough and I wanted this to be a thank you. Um, so for that, that was my vision. And then in terms of where it's gone, it's exceeded my expectations. And I, and I really do wanna say a thank you to um, Robert Raven and, I mean, he has been so, he was the first person to screen my film. I mean, the March on Washington Film Festival. I mean, I, I said, I'm interested, and he's like, yes, <laughs> yes. And, and, and I say that, and I know it's not because of my film, it's because of Mrs. Hamer, and because of people like him and Samantha who believe that these stories deserve to be told. Mm -hmm. Um, they give us a space to do that. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm so grateful to him. And uh, I, I am, I, I, I really am because he, um, I'll tell you, before I even got um, really rolling, I had gone to a film and television conference and I hadn't even really gotten into production. And I met this gentleman who acquires content. And it was this, you know, this old white man, no offense to white men out there, but um, he, all you white men are down if you're here. But um, uh, he said to me, he's like, well, what are you working on? I said, oh, I have content, I have this great story. And he said, that's not gonna sell, no one wants to hear that. 
He really, I mean, he really literally said that. He's like, no, no one's gonna wanna hear that. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, I did this film anyway. And then you have someone like Robert who gives you a space, who, who believes her voice mm -hmm. deserves to be honored. Mm -hmm. So at any rate, so I'm grateful for that. And um, you know, I think the joy is I've gotten to take it into schools mm -hmm. and to introduce it to students who mm -hmm. never knew about mm -hmm. her, mm -hmm. um, who have said, I didn't, I didn't know that that's what that was like. And I didn't know about this woman. And, I didn't know, and it makes me think about what I can do mm -hmm. in the future. So that's been really rewarding. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Well, before we open our question and answer up to our audience, uh, we will. I do have one last question for Ms. Ladner. You and Ms. Hamer were both females in a male-dominated society and a male-dominated movement, as we know. What gave you and Mrs. Hamer the strength to continue working despite the obvious danger and brutality that you faced? Uh, I've often thought about that myself. Um, <laughs> by a um, force of nature, a, a God within me, uh, I did not want to uh, endure what my ancestors had gone through as I saw it when Emmett Till was murdered. It came to me that I had to do something about it. I was a year younger than he, and um, I've always been a strong-willed person. so. Um, and growing up in my mother's house, she started training us when we were very young that we were not to be brutalized by anyone. Don't let anyone brutalize you uh, or take advantage of you or do anything to you from the other race or from your race. So that stood with me. And uh, I'm not sure uh, why, you know, I've been on this road, but <laughs> having met Miss Hamer, I'm sure Miss Hamer had had this vision or this dream herself, you know, uh, that she always wanted to be free. And when she met a group of young people such as we were, mm -hmm. uh, they took up with us and they, we had the message and they were ready to go. Mm -hmm. So when we came with the message, uh, they followed. But that's putting it sort of childish like, but I'm not quite sure uh, why I've been on this journey since I was 14 years old. And uh, with God's strength, I will continue. And uh, I look, I'm looking at the strides that have been made. We've made strides, and we keep getting pushed back, but we have to keep pushing. Yeah. We have to keep pushing, going forward. Never stop and say, oh, no, uh, we've done all we could. You have to keep pushing, mm -hmm. keep pushing. Never, ever stop. I come from the state of Mississippi, one of the, what they call the worst states in Mississippi. And I was one of the most fierce people in Mississippi. So, so the two of us, you know, were always at loggerheads. And uh, so, but with God's grace, you know, I'm still on this earth. I've been through some very dangerous kinds of situations. But uh, like Ms. Hamer, I, Ms. Hamer, you know, I felt her pain because I'm going to start. I have to say all these things while I have the opportunity, if you bear with me. When Ms. Hamer came to Jackson, uh, she, was, she and Ms. Meg Evans was killed June 12th, uh, 1963. Ms. Hamer and Uvest and all them were beaten June 12th, 1963. And uh, they came to uh, Jackson, Lynch Street. I don't know if you know, you're familiar with Mississippi, uh, Jackson State, the same street. Ms. Ms. Hamer was brought down, she and Lawrence Guillard, who was almost beaten to death, too. He was the chairman of the Mississippi Supreme Democratic Party. They were brought down to Jackson. And uh, Ms. Hamer, I can, when that picture of her sitting there all blooded and blue. Uh, but I was looking at Ms. Hamer face to face. Her, she had bloodshot eyes, and she was very short. And her whole body was uh, completely black and blue. And, and, and she was stiff. She couldn't, couldn't move. I mean, she her body was, had been brutalized. And Guillot was very, very fair. He had his shirt on, his back like a piece of raw steak. It was so brutalized. And so uh, these images are still here. And Meg Evans had been killed the same night, you know, June 12th. I was with him the night he was murdered. So uh, Ms. when they came down to Jackson from the Delta, Montgomery County, Mississippi, where Miss Hame was born Montgomery County, Mississippi, and uh, was standing there and seeking medical attention. Uh, it makes you stronger. I was young, I was 20 years old, I think, and I said, oh, I can't stop. You know, I've got to keep going. 
because they had murdered Mr. Evans, and, and we were on full alert. This young people, Student Unbound Coordinating Committee, and Dave Dennis was caught. We were on alert. We had to do something. We had to do something to right this wrong. And so uh, from then on, you know, our lives have been dedicated for whatever reason. And uh, Ms. Hamer died, and uh, I went to her funeral in Rubio, Mississippi. If you'll so indulge me, uh, it was sad. Ms. Hamer had packed into her life all that she could those years that she had been off that plantation and before she went, uh, before she, while she was on the plantation. Uh, but at her funeral, you had all kinds of people there. Andrew, uh, Reverend uh, Andrew Young de de delivered the eulogy. He said, the, pans that, the hands that picked the cotton picked the president. And uh, you had H. Rob Brown there, you had uh, Stokely Carmichael came, I mean, all kinds of people from everywhere. Uh, there at her funeral in this little church in Rueville. But uh, she had lived a life of one that all of us would want our legacies to be. That she had done a lot for everybody. And you know, the story, when the story is finally written, that's the way it was written, was written for her, she's there, right? But Ms. Hamer was very humble very humble. And I used to enjoy sitting around Ms. Hamer, Ms. Victoria Gray Adams, uh, Ms. Ann Devine, all of them ran for Congress after that. And so uh, I would always sit around and listen to them talk. You know, they were older people and, and just hear the folk tales. Uh, and the one thing that I got from them was that uh, when they were growing up, they were told that uh, women were supposed to be in a certain place. And you could, you could talk, but you couldn't be heard, and you had to stand in a certain place. But these, don't let anyone tell you. Don't believe it. it. Don't matter how young you're out there or what year you are in college, you had some ferocious women in Mississippi. <laughs> <laughs> ferocious. Uh, they, they, when they took them to battle, they went forward. There was no, no such thing as a sting in the background. Uh, not not for me, but I, I jumped over that line. <laughs> the line was drawn in sand for me. I stepped over that line when I was a teenager. <laughs> I had to go. I had to go. No, no. Uh, Don't talk about it. I, if, I, if I had gone south, I was too bad to go south. I was already south. I was already south, and I was bad. Yeah. So don't, don't let anybody tell you that. But all I'm saying is that whatever we can do, do that. Everybody can't do what I did. Everybody can't do what Ms. Hamer did. But whatever you can offer in service, do that. Mm -hmm. Do mm -hmm. that for the betterment of yourself and for your community. That, that's a great note, too. <laughs> to open the floor for questions from the audience. Why did you decide to do a short and not a feature? Because um, there were some little bits of story that I was like, oh, I would love to hear a little I know. more about. Oh. I know. There were so many things that I wanted to add. I mean, just hearing Mrs. Ladner talk about um, women, there was a great clip when Mrs. Hamer was interviewed um, when uh, the, the interviewer asked her, you know, some of the men are saying you need to sit down and, you know, step back. And she gave this answer that was so funny. She's like, well, why don't you tell them to go home and stay with their grandkids? <laughs> I, it was so brilliant. But I just, the problem is it was a short because of, it really all came down to money. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it pains me how expensive it is to do um, a film like this, particularly when it comes to archival mm -hmm. footage. There were mm -hmm. so many stories and nuggets that I think would have even given, I would have had so much more of Mrs. Hamer in there mm -hmm. if I could have. But um, a lot of the footage was from the black and white of her testifying um, mm -hmm. during the uh, congressional, the committee, credential committee, and her in that yellow dress. That's network, they own, networks own that. Mm -hmm. And so footage of her in that yellow dress, that's $81 a second. So, yeah, so I used a total of 243 seconds mm -hmm. of that footage and then was able to negotiate that rate down. So you have to sit there and pinch every penny when you're doing 
uh, documentary film. And if you don't have people backing you, mm -hmm. You don't have any money, and so I wasn't gonna. I didn't want to be one of these people that let this story languish for you know 20 years trying to get money that I didn't know was guaranteed. I was fortunate enough. I got a small grant from the Rubin Foundation. They were wonderful. They helped me. Um, you know, it was a $5,000 grant, and I just stretched that in terms of um, finding a crew, interviewing people. Thank God, Mrs. Ladner was local, mm -hmm. and um, and Mrs. Booth, Heather Booth, was local. And you just, you just have to make it work. But it, it was very hard. I, I wish I could have made it longer because I, it's always good to have people want more than say, mm -hmm. like walk out early. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, cause I feel like I wanted more, mm -hmm. you know? I, I wanted more and there were so many more stories to, to tell. I mean, we didn't even get to talk about the work she did after she ran for Congress mm -hmm. and her work with Head Start and her work with uh, the pig farm and the co-op. I mean, she just, she just did so, so much. But anyway, thank you for asking. Other questions? Oh. Hi, can you hear me? Um, Stephanie Rohn's here. Um, I think it was excellent. I commend you. Oh, it was just you. wonderful. Thank you. Um, thank you. And Ms. Ladner, it's amazing that you can recall all of those names and details. That's a true blessing for us, thank you. Um, my question is to Ms. Uh, Hamilton. Um, the most provocative thing that I've ever heard in life is when Fannie Lou Hamer described the beating in the jail. I can never forget that speech that she gave about that. And I was just wondering why you didn't include that. Uh, well, I included parts of it, but I couldn't include the whole thing because, again, it was the footage was so expensive. And I, and I, again, I think that's what my where my frustration was was that, um, you know, these stories really are being held hostage by these big corporations. It's so frustrating because if people at the network ne network executives don't think that it's a story worth being told, then they make it cost prohibitive for independent filmmakers to be able to tell the story. So um, I've had other people say, I wish she could have you know, had more of that, but I really had to splice and dice. I mean, I think that her testimony was a total of like, you know, 97 seconds. And I, you know, you have to pay for every single second right. of that. So, and it gets, it's just so expensive. Okay, next question. This is our last question. Oh, okay, well, I'll try to make it quick then, just in case you're working one more. But um, I thought it was fantastic, and there were so many great moments that really stood out in the telling of her story and the way that you um, brought her story to life. Thank you. you know, and one of the things that um, was quick but powerful to me um, was towards the end as, as her daughter was talking about her father mm -hmm. and his support of her and that he was behind her. And I love the way that you were able to tell that quickly, but it was very powerful. And so, Ms. Ladner, I was curious, um, you know, as you spoke about how women were regarded by many men um, in the movement, not all, clearly, but I was wondering how um, common was it where there were, yeah, and the men in your life, um, be it, you know, husbands, brothers, partners, you know, fathers, how supportive were they of you and of other women who were, you know, kind of leading the charge when they themselves maybe weren't out on the forefront, you know, the front lines, I should speak. Well, um, when we started out, um, there was a small group of us, um, and um, I was, I ended up being the only female with the guys who were working in Mississippi at the time, and uh, <clears throat> we were on an equal, uh, a level playing field because we were facing a common enemy at that particular time. And uh, I didn't have any uh, reason to be uh, demanding of them. And uh, we were all try fighting for our lives. And throughout the movement, uh, I would dare say that we and SNCC went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the men and Sue Not Violent Coordinating Committee. You had some very strong-willed <laughs> people, <laughs> willed women. You didn't come there unless you were ready to uh, face, face the community first. You faced the community before you came to SNCC. So when you came into SNCC, you were ready to faced each other. But um, you must also remember that uh, this was the beginning of the 60s, on the eve of the 50s, the 50s. I grew up around the period of the 50s. 
and uh, women were seen uh, and not heard, but we were on that border because you'd had the boycott in uh, Montgomery, Alabama, 1955, and uh, where <clears throat> you had Miss Park and other women who had been in the forefront of the Montgomery bus boycott. So that uh, was kind of had, uh, spread across the nation, so to speak, and women were getting their voices. But when we started out, you know, I was with the church and the school in, the, in my little community. That's all I had. But uh, I had strong teachings in the home. So um, we went toe-to-toe, -to -toe and, and uh, I don't uh, take too well to men who want to uh, try to dictate to me. <laughs> <laughs> no? Well, uh, on that note. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do want to take a, a, a minute to thank our distinguished panel, our phenomenal director, Robin Williams, our elder activist, Ms. Dory Latner. Uh, thank you for sharing your vision and your thoughts and your experiences. Thank you for sharing this film. Thank you for sharing Ms. Hamer with us. And I'll turn it over to Sam now. I don't know about you, but I feel full. I feel rich. I feel blessed. I feel gifted. I feel honored. All those words are words of my true feelings, so I hope they're similarly to yours. Thank you so, so, so very much to each of you, Kim, for leading this amazing discussion. Robin, she's a newer friend, but we feel like we've known each other for a very long time. And we're so grateful to you um, for the work you've done to bring Mrs. Hamer's stories more to, to light. And to you, Miss Dory, I call her Miss Dory, and her sister, Miss Joyce. And I just found out on Facebook, Miss Joyce sent me a Facebook request. <laughs> she did. She, the the, well, your sister is a Facebooker. She is active. <laughs> and, and for a, a, a plug, we, I shared the, the uh, panel um, on the Rock Newman Show, which is coming on tonight at 8 and, and again at 11 um, on WHUT, Howard University's television. Last week, we talked about what Ms. Dory just touched on the trauma and the stress and the anxiety that people of color have experienced and continue to experience. It's not good. And it literally is not good for our health. There's an, there's an epigenetic transfer of stress. And from generation to generation, it's passed on. But there's an inherent richness and resilience that we embody. And you're an example of that, that through all that trauma, you can sit here, recount the stories, and be able to find the courage and the strength to, to share with us so that we can understand where we come from, the shoulders on which we stand, and where we ought to be going. And we praise you for that. So I touched Miss Joyce last week. I got to hang out with you tonight. I just feel so good. <laughs> um, you know, you asked a question, you know, I don't know why me. You were called and you answered the call. It is a unique position, but you are exactly where you need to be. And we will continue to lift you up and as we take this journey together, because it's a journey that we have together. Thanks to all of our festival friends, old ones and new ones. We hope you enjoy this evening and we hope that you will continue to keep in touch with us, learn more about our festival and the work that we're doing and this, how very important it is to have this platform to responsibly tell the stories the way we ought to tell it and to share the truths and to have people 
who will help tell the stories while they're here. Part of our vision is also to be able to fund independent filmmakers like Miss Hamilton so that she doesn't have to experience the challenges and the barriers to tell these stories. It's a long-term vision, but we believe that we'll be able to make it happen. I wouldn't be a good steward, a good executive director of this organization if I didn't encourage you, again, to keep in touch, but as, it, you, as you leave and exit through the doors, uh, we'll share an envelope with you. We encourage you to, if you so choose, make a pledge. You can mail it in or you can write it tonight uh, or whenever convenient. But at minimum, keep in touch. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Um, thank you so much to NYU for hosting us. Tom and your team, you are amazing, phenomenal partners, and we look forward to growing this with you. Thanks to my amazing team, uh, our producer, our director of communications, our development manager, and everyone else who made this evening possible. And thank you to you again. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Have a wonderful evening.